abroad because nobody wants to be abroad and struggling. Nobody yeah. wants to be abroad and like not doing the things that they want to be doing. It doesn't make any sense. And I feel that by building a business, you can build an asset to support yourself, an asset that you can sell at some point or an asset that you can grow and grow and grow. Welcome to the You Are a Lawyer podcast, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. <laughs> me too. So you and I have spoken before and we talked about just, would you be a guest? How excited I was to share your story with the audience. But we actually were just chatting about Europe. And it is December when we're recording this. We're talking about the lack of insulation in Spain because that's actually where you live. <laughs> I'm based here in Valencia, Spain. I've lived in Spain for the past five years. It is a wonderful country. You know, every country has its ups and downs and things like that. One of the downs is that they don't believe in central air and heating. And so okay. I love it, but it's like, come on. I'm just a little bit cold. Yeah. So when I think of Spain, I think of the sun and tropical and amazing, right? Does it actually get cold? Like, do you have a true change of seasons there? It does. It does. And what's so fascinating is that I think most people, and I definitely did before I visited Spain, think of Southern Spain when they think okay. of Spain. Like, think of flamenco, they think of Sevilla and Andalusia. But Spain is graphically diverse. It has so many different, like, mountain ranges that are, like, snow-capped most of the year. There's the Spanish Pyrenees. You have Galicia that's kind of like Ireland. It's, like, weird. You're like, what is this place? It's, like, rainy and green all the time. Uh, I lived in La Rioja, which is, like, a nice valley for all the beautiful wine that they create there. I lived in Catalonia, which is right between the Mediterranean Sea and some mountains as well. And now I'm Valencia. And so, yeah, I would say that I'm from Atlanta and I lived in Miami and it's not as warm and okay. it's not as warm or as mild or temperate in the winter as Atlanta or Miami, but it's not it's not crazy. Okay. I'm a little bit, I, I'll admit, like I'm a little bit thin skinned when it comes to that. So I, I whine a lot, but I don't really get that cold. At least yeah. I'm not going to, you know, the mountains. I'm not going to Cantabria or Asturias in the wintertime. So it's actually quite lovely. Okay. So we are recording this for YouTube. And if I cannot pinpoint every city that you just mentioned, I will definitely show the country of Spain and where Valencia is so that we all can recognize that you're not in the south of Spain. <laughs> you are in a different type of region in Valencia. So... Christine, we're mentioning this very casually, but you live in Spain. Like, I'm still like, oh my God, amazing, amazing. How did you get there and why did you decide to move there permanently? Oh my goodness. I always wanted to live in Spain since okay. I was 17 years old. I went to University of Georgia for undergrad and I knew more than like my major or anything else that I was going to do there that I was going to study abroad. <laughs> And so I was just like, that's all I'm going to do. I ended up being like talked to and got some good sense uh, and good advice by like my academic advisor who was like, girl, you're not a biology major. You cannot go to Costa Rica. And I was like, oh, okay. So I first, uh, or actually the second time I went to Spain was to study abroad here in Valencia, actually 15 years ago, which is like, like, really? But yeah, it's like 15 or maybe even 16 years ago now. And um, I loved it. I had a very interesting experience as a as a black woman. I was the only black person, person of color in my cohort. But I really I enjoyed how I felt being outside the U.S. And I was just always really curious. I graduated from university and I tried to figure out how to move abroad you know, it wasn't a great time to graduate from university. It was like 2009. So it wasn't yeah. like a great time. It was a time where, you know, I had done everything that I was asked of me, right? I, you know, everything in high school, everything in college. And I graduated from college and I don't, I didn't get a job. I couldn't get a job. There wasn't jobs to be had. So I found myself interning and being the world's worst waitress. I only lasted like two months and they were just like, please, oh, please. I was like, you're right. And then working sales and the uh, gene wall 
for the gap after undergrad and just being really upset, right? And and not really understanding. That kind of was instrumental though, because it taught me so much about myself and actually what I do now as a business strategist. I learned a lot in <laughs> working the gap gene wall <laughs> after undergrad. <laughs> I learned how to meditate actually in the dressing rooms because we had to fold up all those jeans after people just demolished them. But yeah, I kind of knew that I still wanted to go abroad and I was doing these jobs. I was asking my mom for any help. She would pull out her Rolodex. I was going through a Rolodex in 2009. (laughs) Yes. Calling people being like, Hey, you don't know me. I'm Adrian's daughter. Do you guys got, you know, do you work abroad? What was that like? How'd you get this job? And people just being like, what? You know, leaving voicemails. Yeah. <laughs> I so, love the initiative I, though. I just, I was trying to make it happen mm-hmm. and uh, I couldn't figure it out. So I ended up deciding with a lot of encouragement from my mother to attend law school. And so I was only a year out. I had gone to undergrad, then took that year off and worked and tried to figure out my life and then decided to go to University of Miami for law school. And that was a whole thing. I went to law school. I knew I wanted to live abroad throughout that experience. After graduating, I had the opportunity to join a startup in downtown Miami. I went on business trade mission to Namibia and South Africa. That kind of encouraged that wanderlust, that kind of like, I know I can do this. And I did that for a while. I went back to Atlanta, did my own business, got burnt out (laughs) and was like, look, I've been wanting to move abroad. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but we got to figure it out. Like I got to, I got to go. And so I took a leap of faith and I took a sabbatical. So I just moved to Spain five and a half years ago, uh, initially just to teach English for nine months. And then I I never left. (laughs) Wow. Was there the option to go to Spain? Or do you think if you would have went in law school, you just never would have came back? (laughs) You would have just stayed? Well, the thing is, like, I I didn't go to Namibia or South Africa um, in law school. I had joined a startup immediately after graduating. So while everyone else was in the law library studying for the bar, I was in Namibia and South Africa. (laughs) Okay. And the interesting thing is, is that my academic advisor in law school, she had told me, I think maybe it was the end of my 1L year, 2L year. She was like, Christine, I see you're getting really involved in student government. She was like, don't do it. She said, you want to look, you want to move abroad? Go to France and study comparative law. Go do wherever, go, go do that. And I didn't listen to her because I was like, yeah, I could do both. No, you can't. I ended up becoming the president of my law school class and not studying abroad in in a law school. And in hindsight, I should have studied abroad. <laughs> I, should have been, I shouldn't have tried to go for a president of law school because, you know, what does that mean? Not yeah, <clears throat> but also I love that your desire to study abroad and to live abroad kept coming back up. Right. It wasn't just like a one off thought. And you're like, oh, that would be fun. And then you kind of forget about it. I like that it kept revisiting you. Like, remember, there's more out here. Come on. (laughs) So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think, honestly, now that you say it like that, I feel like it was kind of like a beacon. It was something that I was very sure of. And during that time, you know, graduating from undergrad and being like, I ain't got a job. What am I supposed to do now? That was the thing I was sure of in law school, wanting to be first an entertainment attorney, then being like, no, that's not for me. You know, working for a federal magistrate, working for Zumba Fitness, general counsel, being like, no, no, that's not for me either. The only thing that I was really sure about was going my own way. That's the only thing I was sure about. And it was weird because half of me was really confident and half of me was like, girl, that's not what everyone else is doing. (laughs) Like, We got to do what everyone else is doing. And uh, it took me a long time to kind of get that kind of confidence, trust kind of that voice. But we got there eventually. (laughs) We did. So I have to ask this question because when you were studying abroad or living abroad, that was when everybody else was studying for the bar exam. What was that experience like when you were like, 
I'm not taking it. Right. You're just like, no, I'm not I'm not doing it because that can be a really hard decision for people when law school, you go through the three years and it's pushing you to this test and you're like, no, I'm not doing it. What was that like? Oh, that was it was easy for me and everyone else hated it. Everyone hated it. So my 3L year, I was president of my law school class. So it has a lot of perks. Like I could have gotten like some discounts for like Barbary and all this other stuff. And everybody was like, yeah, just promote it. And I was like, I'm not taking the bar. And people were like, what? The president of the law school class can't not take the yeah. bar. But people tried to persuade me. And I was in a very interesting headspace at the time. Before I even left to move to Miami to go to law school, my mom had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And my little sister was 16 at the time and she was still in the house. And so I almost didn't even go to law school. And I had that whole process because it is a process, a lot of chemo, radiation, port being put in. My mom had several surgeries while I was in Miami. So I had a lot of that on me. I think also I was just really fed up with the uh, with the politics of law school also i i had good intentions in trying to becoming the president of the law school and um i found myself thwarted at every at every instance you know yeah. i got pushback from the student senate when i said i wanted to cut the beer budget so we could reinvest in you know some professional development and then I got pushed back from the admin for some of the ideas that I had, which was largely about really emphasizing non-traditional pathways for JDs, because at that point I had recognized that was going to be my pathway. Mm-hmm. And also the legal market was contracting and it was already kind of like an initiative at my law school that you, we need to place obviously more students and things like that when they're graduated, which obviously every law school wants to do. But I wanted to do something different. And I was getting so much pushback from everyone and I had so much going on that by the time I was in my 3L year, I was a woman that was just fed up <laughs> and I didn't care what anybody had to say about anything at all. That was <laughs> I was quite upset by the time I actually graduated and walked across the stage, which I did not want to do. I had called my mom and said, mom, don't come to Miami. I'm not going to walk. She was like, this is not about you. I'm coming to Miami. You will walk. Also, I was the first one to be, uh, what is it even called? To be bestowed there. Yes, I was the first one. So she was like, "Uh uh-uh, get on that stage across that stage. So making that decision to to not take the bar was less actually about, I don't know, necessarily not wanting to practice. I think it was just me asserting myself and what I wanted to do. I didn't believe I wanted to practice traditionally and I wanted to go my own way. And I had gotten a job that was in a startup and I was like, okay, I got a job. Y'all said I couldn't get, I literally got a job. I got a job before a lot of people did. So what are you talking about? And uh, yeah. And so when I got that job and they were like, okay, we're in a startup, we're in a warehouse in downtown Miami. Now the startup scene in Miami is very sleek and nice. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we were in a warehouse. Okay. (laughs) And 10 years ago, downtown Miami was not popping. Okay. Um. Yeah, I was there in a warehouse and then the director was like, do you got a passport? And I was like, yeah. She's like, all right, well, give it to me. And I was like, why? (laughs) She's like, oh, we're going to Namibia and South Africa on trade mission. And so for me, that was a confirmation. I'm, you know, it's about three weeks after graduation and I'm in Africa. I'm talking to the then U.S. ambassador to Namibia, who was a black woman at the time. And she's the one that is uh, hosting us in Namibia. Like, for wow. me, that was confirmation. I was like, oh, bar? Absolutely not. <laughs> so what I love about your story and what I keep hearing is that even though you did go to law school at the prodding of someone else, right, your mom encouraged you, you still were fighting to do it your own way the whole time. No, we're going to cut the budget for this. No, I don't want to do that. Look, we need more professional development, right? 
And I think that's really important because right now you actually work as a consultant where you promote women of color on how to start their own businesses, how to run thriving businesses. Did you start that since moving to Spain or was that something that you carried over with you when you moved abroad? I actually started consulting while I was in law school. Okay. So I had did I did one L summer traditionally, you know, federal magistrate actually I mean, I asked the federal magistrate judge if I could cut my summer in half so I could work for Zumba for half the summer. That's not done. You don't do that. I was like, look, my parents aren't lawyers, so I got to test out everything I think I want to do before I commit to something. OK, I don't have a job like waiting for me. Mm -hmm. So after that, though, I was like, I don't think I want to be a traditional lawyer. And the thought of leaving law school didn't enter my mind because I was like, can't do that. Yeah. And so I was looking for just something else. And so I was a really big nerd, still am. I used to read the university wide email newsletters that nobody reads. Like they send yeah. it out and I like nobody reads those. They're like, what's happening on campus? But I do. So I'm like, oh, what is happening on campus? And there's this spotlight on the director, the entrepreneurship incubator at the University of Miami. And I just read her story and I was just like, she is amazing. She mm -hmm. had been an entrepreneur since she was 16. She'd done all these things. And I was just like, she might know, she might know something that I need to know. And so I would go down to the uh, incubator, which is called the launch pad. And I would just wait for her and I'd be like, hey, is Dr. Amat coming in? And they'd just be like, who are you? Do you have an appointment? And I was like, no, I just, I'm a fan. I don't know. I don't want to be on the law school campus. Yeah. And so eventually people were like, who are you? What do you want? And then they were like, do you want to be the legal fellow? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I, I want to do that. And so that for me really changed a lot because I have a business degree from the University of Georgia. I have this legal experience. And then pairing it together in this incubator, I was just like, they were just like, just go and, and advise. I wasn't really like trained. And yeah. it just was an amazing natural fit because mm -hmm. I got to hold space for these young entrepreneurs, 18, 19, who had never, you know, really stood out on their own, maybe apart from their parents, to people who have like family businesses. And I really got to think critically and to devise better plans for them strategically and technically, right, with business foundation and, and things like that. But also like emotionally, because entrepreneurship is very emotional, a lot of psychology, which I didn't recognize until I was in it. And I was like, we're not really talking about the business model, right. we're really talking about you and your family and yeah. your, in your relationship. So for me, that changed it all. That's how I ended up with the job in the startup after graduation, because it was an accelerator in downtown Miami. After that, uh, I went back to Atlanta. Uh, I started my own consultancy, just doing some business strategy, a lot of ideation, product development for people in the wellness sector. And then when I moved to Spain, I had put that on hiatus and then I, re I revived it. Okay. Because I kind of did everything that I wanted to do. I was on sabbatical. <laughs> I was a freelance writer. I was a digital nomad. And I worked for a business that was based in DC. And then I was like, that's not for me either. It's not being in like Southeast Asia and having meetings at 4 a.m. Yeah. It's not for me. Like that. <laughs> so, yeah. To me, I think it's a natural pairing that you will become a consultant because your story is not. What do I want to say? Your story is atypical. <laughs> How about that? People do not read school newsletters. <laughs> People don't read regular newsletters they enroll in, right? People do not say, I'm going to show up at the office. People do not say, I'm going to still run for president of the 3 L class. You know what I mean? People don't do those things. So I think it's really beneficial that you take all of your experience, even though you may be like, oh, this is just what I'm what I've always done. You're teaching these other women and other people of color how to say, no, go for what you actually want. Push for it. Push for it. Look, I've done it repeatedly. Definitely. I'm a big believer in having people tell you no and to, and to stop. Like okay. I'm, a, I'm a big believer in being like, like in the States, 
I would I would like write someone an email. I'll follow up. Yeah. I'll get in my car and just roll up on people too. I'd be like, hey, what's up? I'm Christine. What's what's good? Did you get right. my email? Are you going to tell me yes or no? Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know where I got that from, to be honest, because I am a true blue introvert. Like okay. I am an introvert, but I'm also someone that has no problem with uncomfortable situations or like conflict you know I don't think a lot of things are conflict I think a lot of people are just anxious about the supposed uh conflict that may arise than the conflict itself so I I find myself just going after the things that I want not in a crush it kill it kind of way I'm just like tell me no so I can move on I can check it off my list and I can move on yeah, because until you tell me no, then either you're still thinking about it or you want to be convinced. And I can help with that part. But if you tell me no, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think also the great thing about going after what you want, even if you even if the vision is not super clear, you recognize that you really are crafting mm-hmm. your life and your business. You're not waiting for someone to give you anything. You're not waiting for someone to choose you or pick you or think you're really neat. You're saying, I'm here and I'm ready and I'm the one. Absolutely. Give it to me. Put me in, coach. Put me in. I'm ready. Here I am. And if you don't believe me, I promise you, I'll keep showing up so you give me the chance. <laughs> So, Christine, I think this is a great time to segue into your podcast, Flourish in the Foreign. So this podcast is fantastic. You talk to women who are traveling abroad, who are doing things differently, who are just expanding their boundaries, right? Why did you decide to become a podcaster and how do you enjoy doing podcasts? I decided to become a podcaster. I think the, the seeds were planted since I was a child. I was an NPR kid, you know, okay. in the back, <laughs> in the in the car seat, kicking my legs, listening to NPR with my mom. Like, <laughs> that was just what it was. I loved NPR. I loved podcasts like, before, I guess, they were podcasts. Yeah. And um, I wanted to create Flourish in the Floor, and I actually didn't know who was going to be a podcast. I kind of got some encouragement from a friend of mine. But I found that I traveled a lot. I've traveled extensively in my life and I have these amazing stories. I don't necessarily feel like I'm the best storyteller, like retelling the story because I'm the type of person to be like, and then this happened. And then no, wait, that happened two days before. But this was a good part. And people are like, girl, what are you saying? Yeah. So I was encountering these fantastic women, Black women abroad who would just impart so much wisdom. They're their aura would just be amazing. I'm just like, this is incredible, you know, on trips or whatever. I would just meet these women. And I just kept on feeling like other people should hear these stories. Not for me though, because I'm not the best storytelling. Like I need to capture this so other people could hear these stories. And then when I was thinking about that, I thought, wow, you know, had I met this woman, you know, five years earlier, seven years earlier, my whole life would be different. Mm -hmm. Because I think part of the reason why I couldn't figure out how to go abroad before I even went to law school was that I just didn't have any examples of really clear cut, like women going, Black women going abroad in many different ways in different countries, because I felt like I was open. I was like, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. And they're like, calm down. No, you won't. But like, I needed to hear these women. I need to, I need that encouragement, the representation. And so I wanted to create something that showcased Black women telling their own stories, using their own words, their own voices, because I didn't want to be misconstrued. I didn't want to be bastardized Mm -hmm. because something that all of us in the African diaspora can share and resonate with is, is that Our stories have been bastardized since forever because, Mm -hmm. you know, history is told by the perspective of the victor. And I wanted that these Black women's stories who are living abroad, their stories to be the definitive answer, if you wanted to know, particularly because actually right around when I launched my podcast, 
it was 2020, May 2020. And there was a surge of Black Americans interested in moving abroad. And mm -hmm. then there was a lot of articles talking about it. And the articles always centered the white gaze and racism. Yeah. And I was like, Black people have been living abroad since the beginning of time. And for many different reasons. Because, you know, anti-Blackness is global in some aspects, it can be part of the equation for people, but to think that people are just scurrying out of the United States because of this or that yeah. is, is so not true. And that's what happens when you're not in control of your narrative. Mm -hmm. So it was important for me to create this podcast, not only for Black women to see themselves represented, but for them to tell their own stories. Because what I've also found is that my guests will listen to their episode and be like, oh my God, is that me? And I'm like, yes, girl, you're that awesome. And they're also, it also gives them a chance to reflect because they're like, I just been living my life. Like yeah. I hadn't really taken stock of what I've accomplished and how I feel about it. And I feel like it's been really impactful for them. And then also really examining living abroad as a pathway to wellness because living abroad isn't like, you know, baguettes and crips and, you know, Latin lovers. I don't know what people think living abroad is like. It is very much like, you know, taking out your own trash in a different country. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, it's very, you know, various degrees of adulting. But I wanted to examine what living abroad could really, how it could impact wellness. Wellness not meaning crystals and bath bombs, but true embodiment for Black women. So financial wellness, professional wellness, mental and emotional, physical wellness. And I think, uh, I think we've we've had some really great success with it. I'm really proud of what the podcast has done. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I love about the podcast is the honesty in the stories. But your stories and the stories that you share on the Flourish in the Foreign podcast are really honest, right? These women get very vulnerable and they tell you the good, bad, and ugly about any country that they live in. And I could imagine that they would re-listen to it and they're like, oh, I didn't even think it was that groundbreaking because I was just, because the stories kind of, they remind me of your story where they're just like, I wanted to move there. So I moved. I wanted to do this. So I did it. Like there was really no true pushback if they really believed in themselves and they were like, no, I made up my mind. Why not do it? Yeah. I mean, I think, but I think that's the story of black women in general. We just get the job done and just be like, that's what we do. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's also part of that wellness is to, to recognize your greatness, recognize what you've done and to be able to really take stock and, and to appreciate that, you know, and see yourself in that kind of broader aspect, because I think it's easy. I mean, it's easy for me to be like, you know, yeah, I live in Spain. I do all this other stuff. And I'd be like, oh, but you know, this, I, I didn't pitch myself here, or I didn't show up for this panel or all this other stuff that you get caught up in. And you need that perspective to be like, yo, like you've done some things, like, you know, mm -hmm. you've done some things and it's cool. You don't have to stay there, but to appreciate that and to give yourself that credence, especially when we embark on new ventures or endeavors, sometimes it's easy for us to undervalue ourselves and to be like, oh, I don't know if I can. It's like, okay, you probably can do can. anything. Yes. <laughs> so Christine, you mentioned that you strongly believe in being professionally fulfilled and financially abundant when you are living abroad or thinking about going abroad. How does that translate to the just a regular listener in the audience who's like, I want to go abroad. I've never considered being professionally fulfilled, right? Like, what would that look like for me? Um, what kind of tips would you give to someone who's listening? Yeah, I think that two things. You have to decide if you want to be employed abroad or if you want to have your own business or be self-employed abroad, because I think those are, those are two foundational aspects to really consider, right? I want to be professionally fulfilled and financially abundant if I'm going to work for somebody abroad or if I'm going to have my own business, like period, because who wants to go abroad and be miserable 
Like, absolutely not. I, I just tell people like living abroad is already, you know, very special <laughs> most of the time, you know, living in Southern Europe with bureaucracy where they're like, manana, manana. You're like, what? I'm supposed to, I have this paper. <laughs> This is an official document, minyada, minyada. So you want to make sure that regardless of where you go, okay, professionally fulfilled, financially abundant. My specialty is building a business abroad. Okay. But if you decide to be employed abroad, I would say also consider work culture because that's going to be really big in your professional fulfillment. I had a guest on my podcast. She's Jamaican. She actually went to Japan for her master's in architectural design. She speaks fluent Japanese and she works at an architectural firm. But her first like year or six months, she was bullied. And that's typical in Japanese work culture is a bullying culture and working a lot. So it's really important for you to understand what does professionally fulfilled mean to you, which really goes to what does professional wellness look like for you? Who do I work with? How do I interact with people? What are my work hours? What are my standards? What are the things that I'm working on? How am I professionally developed? Like really to have a, your own personal definition of professional wellness. And then also financially abundant would mean really understanding what financial wellness means to you. Because if you, again, are getting employed abroad, you might be working in an emerging economy where maybe the compensation, uh, like the dollars and cents salary isn't very high, but you may have a house, a car, uh, you know, live in help for your kids. Yeah. Uh, your kids go to international school and you get a flight home. Like you, a lot of these things matter. So it's important for you to consider that. If you want to build a business abroad, which is what I love, and I think most people, not most people, I think a lot of people should consider it, especially Black women and women of color, because that's where my heart is at. To, to be professionally fulfilled abroad, I believe it's about betting on yourself and understanding who you want to work with and how you want to work with them. Because that's what's so amazing about working for yourself and building a business that supports not only your professional curiosities, but also supports you financially to live a life well lived abroad because nobody wants to be abroad and struggling. Nobody yeah. wants to be abroad and like not doing the things that they want to be doing. It doesn't make any sense. And I feel that by building a business, you can build an asset to support yourself, an asset that you can sell at some point, or an asset that you can grow and grow and grow. And what I find is that most people don't recognize that they can really take their expertise, their experiences, and package that into a business. It could be a consultancy. It could be a subscription. It could be a community. It could be digital products. It could be so many different things. But it can really be uh, a really an outpouring of your service too in your profession. Yeah. You can really have the impact that you're looking to have and also get paid what you want. And so for that, I would say have a guide. It's called Build a Business Abroad Guide. You can get that. But ultimately, you need to be able to say to yourself and know for yourself what is your number, like the number that makes your, like the financial number that makes your life go round. So you got to be honest yeah. with yourself about that. You need to know what is the work cycle that you're trying to work in. Like if you have small kids, how are you trying to work? Or if you only want to work a couple months out of the year or certain kind of cycles or something like that, that needs to be very clear too, because that will also dictate the business model truly. And perhaps projection for when you can take this from maybe side hustle to full time. And then also you need to do a really good audit of your marketable skills, because I don't necessarily believe in reinventing the wheel. I believe in understanding what you're capable of and maybe applying it across different industries and different projects. But I'm not necessarily the person's like, you know what? Just burn down the past 15 years of your professional life. We're just going to start from zero. Absolutely not. There's no yeah. need to do that. Right. But so understanding your marketable skills, understanding 
what people have always sought you out for. What is your specialty? What is it? And also the thing that you want to keep on doing. And I always tell people it's not necessarily what's on your CV. It could be the things that you did in your professional capacity that nobody paid you for, Mm -hmm. which is a lot for women, honestly. Um, So whether it was like organizing conferences or the speakers for your company's, you know, big conference, you didn't get paid for that, but that might be a specialty for you or putting together events or what have you other kinds of like client relationship things that you did. And everybody was like, oh, but can you do this? And it wasn't really part of your part of your job description, like those types of like, uh, uh, nuanced, uh, tasks and things like that, that can end up being a business for you. Mm-hmm. So I always tell people do a marketable skills analysis, do a really good audit of that, and then, uh, kind of see where they have those overlaps. And that's how I would start that, uh, process of building a business so that you can be professionally fulfilled and financially abundant abroad. Yeah. So, Christine, that was wonderful. And I think it really ties in well to our last question here, which is, do you have any advice for anyone that's listening about all the, (laughs) I want to say miraculous, all the miraculous things that you've done with your law degree and with your experience in living abroad right now? Yeah, I would say um, if you're thinking about practicing abroad or just doing something different, it never hurts to have another language. So learn another language because that makes you marketable across so many different sectors and industries. And you'll be able to take your law degree into different parts of the world. So I would say do that. The second thing is, is that I think it's really important for you to be really honest about what does a life well lived look like for you. Sometimes it's hard to be honest with ourselves because if we feel like we're super honest, we might crumble with the <laughs> with the results. But it's really important for you to be honest about what is it that you are seeking in your life and understand that you are worth the risk. So you're worth the bet on yourself, like your happiness, your fulfillment, the curiosities of your heart, they're worth being explored and whatever you need to do. And I'm not saying this, like, just, you know, quit your job and just leave tomorrow. But I think it's really important for you to, to be honest with yourself and give those desires and give that vision some, some air and some light. I would also say that if you're thinking about going abroad with a legal degree, think about starting your own business. I think so. I think it makes sense. I know so many people who have law degrees, maybe they're still practicing, maybe they're not, who've been able to do amazing things around the world with their legal degree. I would, I would say do that. And if all else fails, I would say if you have the time Walk the Camino de Santiago, which is what I did in well, 2014. It's a 30-day, well, for me, it was 33-day trek across Spain. And just, you know, take a long walk. Think about your life. Think about what you really want. It helps. It really yeah. does help. I think that what I sometimes feel sad for the younger lawyers, you know, in, in the United States is that I think you could probably feel very trapped by the situation, like you might have a lot of legal debt or, you know, you have a lot of expectation with your family and you see all your friends and they're doing all this stuff. And I was the same way. I had gone rogue and all my friends had were making lots of money. And I was like, <laughs> for myself, like, this make no sense. I think though, you have to give yourself a chance. So, so give yourself that space. You know, I don't want you guys to feel like this is the only thing I can do. And if I don't do it, then I'm a failure. No, you can, you can go and do whatever you want. And I think, uh, even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, a spirit of curiosity and maybe of innovation and entrepreneurship will do you well because you will go and research and you will put yourself up for opportunities or just to be in conversation with people and it will change your life. So I would I would say that. I would say go out and heed the call of your heart. 
if that's what you know, like it doesn't mean that it has to be in opposition to you practicing law, but it's important for you to do that, I think. Yeah. First of all, this was a special episode because Christine, you are a lawyer, right? My whole thing is talking to lawyers who do really cool, really funky things, have side hustles, have all these things outside of their degree. And you have definitely embodied that. But also for everyone listening, just remember that your law degree will show up, your education will show up in many different places, right? You do not have to be going into a courtroom. You do not have to be walking into that big law office to be using your degree. Okay, so re-listen to the episode. If you're like, how's Christine using her degrees? I could probably list 12 ways <laughs> because it's constantly being shown in all these different ways. Um, and even with you living in Valencia, Spain and creating a life that you love. So. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like being an entrepreneur is all about being a problem solver. And I feel like lawyers are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're researchers and we're like, it depends. We investigate, you know, I feel like it's actually really well suited. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Oh, of course. All right. Bye. Bye.